I'm very pleased that we um, could turn up for our uh, speakers tonight. Um, the, uh, they're going to give some brief remarks and then uh, we'll have a, an opportunity not so much just to have questions and answers about their specific uh, points, but also to try to bring some of your uh, ideas and so forth into the uh, issue because we're really concerned about getting the community involved from the very beginning uh, on dealing with this. So. Um, uh, we have three speakers. The first one is going to be Douglas Novick. Of the, he's the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of San Antonio. After Doug will be Dr. Hassan Rashid, Rashid Ali. And uh, he's at UTSA College of Architecture, Construction and Planning. He's going to be the person who coordinates the entire Climate Action Planning Project. And he's got his life set up for him for the next two years on that. And then uh, Hudit Vega, uh, who uh, works with Metropolitan Health uh, District, and uh, she is going to be working together with a person from um, uh, Mr. Melnick's office to have uh, coordinate as much of the uh, community involvement processing uh, as possible. And uh, I'm very excited because both of these people are really, really uh, good people to be working on community involvement and community engagement. So I'm very excited to uh, have them involved. So uh, Doug, could you start first, please? Thank you, and thanks for, for having us. I'm sure we'll be here a lot over the next few years. Um, I'll be here again tomorrow, so if you <laughs> <to> come back. <laughs> So I'm just going to cover a little bit of the sort of the history, um, how we got to this point, a little bit about why we're doing this, uh, and then I think we're going to leave it to, to Hazan to, to get into sort of the meat of, of what we're looking at as far as um, the plan. I think we want to keep our, um, our discussion, um, our presentation very brief. We really just want to hear from you. We want to hear what your, your objectives, your concerns, um, questions so we can start incorporating those and, and addressing them early on in the process. But you've all probably been working on climate for years, um, well, a lot longer than, than I've been in San Antonio. I've been here for about three and a half years. But when I, when I got here, one of the big priorities was to start figuring out how we could start moving towards addressing climate. And so one of the first things I had done was I, I met with mayor and council members uh, and you know and, and on just general sustainability um, uh, uh, ideas that, or passions that they had and nobody wanted to talk about climate. I mean, it was just it was not on the table. Um, even even Councilman Nuremberg didn't want to you know really get into it. So um, instead of trying to force the issue at that time, it was it was basically, well, how do we how do we approach this? So what we did was we developed the, the SA Tomorrow Sustainability Plan. And um, I don't want to say it was a Trojan horse, but it was how do we start discussing climate? How do we start discussing resilience without it um, uh, being too intimidating? So when you look at the sustainability plan, you know, we, we, we did a greenhouse gas inventory, so we have that baseline for municipal operations in the community sector. We did a climate vulnerability assessment. We did a climate trend analysis. Uh, we didn't do any climate projections because nobody wanted to touch that at that time. But we were able to get uh, Dr. Catherine Hago to just take a look at some existing data that we had and, 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 and present it. And so the intent was that it was going to sometime in the future lead to some sort of climate action. And, and last June, before the plans were even adopted, we were presenting to a comprehensive plan committee and immediately, um, council bit. They started asking, well, is this a climate action plan? Well, no, this isn't a climate action plan. This is a sustainability plan. So explaining what's the difference. Sustainability plan is much broader. Uh, it, it's looking at things from, from food systems, to natural resources, to, to energy. Um, the climate action plan is very much looking at, okay, it's greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions, uh, as well as the impacts associated with, with climate change. And so council was interested in moving forward. And so it just took some time working with um, with council to, to get to that point. Um, change in, in, in leadership really you know, was a, a big a, a big 
uh, opportunity. I think if, um, if, if Mayor Narenberg didn't win, if we were still poised to do something under, un, under Mayor uh, Taylor, it wouldn't have been as uh, big a leap, but I think we were, we were prepared to start doing more work. But it's, it's a great opportunity now for, for San Antonio to really, to really step up. Um, you know, when you look at the list of the top cities across the country, you probably all know this, um, Texas is, is notably absent. Uh, you know, when you look at um, the top 10 cities uh, by population, and then, you know, continuing to go down the list, the, the only cities without, um, you know, a climate action plan either completed or in the works uh, are Dallas and Houston. Uh, you know, Houston has a municipal plan, but they don't have a community plan. Um, in Dallas, I'm not quite sure what's going on in Dallas right now. But they, they have a chief resilience officer at least. So it's an opportunity for us to really, um, other than Austin, uh, but to start doing what needs to be done. And I think, uh, again, like I said, there's, uh, there's, there's a good opportunity. I think when you look at a lot of the national um, uh, surveys that, that have been done around, um, by uh, organizations like uh, Eco America, where they, they start um, basically surveying people's attitudes. Bear County has got, you know, when they ask simple questions, do you believe that, you know, that climate change is occurring? Do you believe it's something that should be, be addressed? You know, over you know, 60 to 68 percent of respondents in Bear County you know, agree. And that's higher than all, you know, a lot of places nationally. So we have, we have the base here. It's, it's, and one of the things that we'll talk about, I'm sure, is engagement, how do you mobilize that base? How do you talk about climate with folks? Because um, lots and lots of research shows that you can't simply necessarily, you, you think you guys are special, you, know, you, you, you get it, you believe in it, but um, it's about how do we discuss climate in terms um, with different stakeholders in a manner that's not going to basically shut them down. Um, and so it's translating it, uh, sometimes we might, we might not even mention climate. But kind of might be just sort of a off to the side of talking about what, what is important to them um, in, in their lives. And that was one of the things when under, under Mayor Taylor, when we were trying to have conversations around climate, we couldn't use the term climate. Um, so we were talking about like, you know, about when it be the good life. Um, and that's something that's been used in other communities. And it's worked really well because people get that. They know what kind of life they want for themselves and, and their, their children and their grandchildren. And using that as a jumping off point for um, what the future could be like uh, if we don't tackle this this issue. Um, I'll let him talk about the climate action and adaptation plan. And the, the, the last thing I just wanted to mention was sort of why we're doing this. And so, has anyone read the the latest um, uh, national climate assessment? The one was leaked by um, the New York Times. Of it. And that's being still, it's still being, you know, sat on um, um, by, by the federal government. But it's pretty clear, you know, uh, as far as the impacts are, are just getting worse. Um, 2014 was the warmest year on record. Um, then it was surpassed by 2015 and then by 2016. Uh, 16 is the last 17 years of the warmest years on record. Um, Heavy precip precipitation events in most of the United States increased both in intensity and frequency since 1901. Extreme temperatures in the contiguous United States are predicted to increase even more than that average temperature. So I mean, it's the trends that we've been seeing, the the, um, the science is 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 there. I think as we start, and I think when we talk about engagement, and we're going to need all sort of all hands on deck, and what we were, we were talking about this before that. Uh, to do engagement right, it's got to be more than just meetings. It's really getting to, to, to people in their neighborhoods. It's really labor intensive, it's really difficult, and no one really does it well. And I think if you look at folks nationally, people do some things good, some you know, We tend to rely a lot on social media and technology, and which is great, and we're gonna be doing all of that, but it's really about getting into the neighborhood. So really relying on groups like the Sierra Club, Go Centro, other partners to work together and figure out how do we get out there and talk to people who wouldn't ordinarily be um, uh, involved, and talking to them in a way that's not necessarily the way, and get some meaningful input so we can all bring it together. So I think we have a lot of high hopes with engagement. Um, 
but we're going to, to need your help to do so. Um, with that, and looking forward to your questions, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Hazen to talk a little bit about the, sort of the scope of the plan and, and the process. So again, thank you all for inviting me here. Thank you for inviting the three of us. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and I'm sure it will be the first of many times in which we'll come and talk to you and solicit your feedback and your input on what we hope to be a, a very successful process. So, uh, climate action plan. I mean, just saying the words is exciting, right? Uh, <laughs> it is really for me at least. Actually, the first time I heard about this was sitting in the ceremony where the city was signing. Uh, their commitment to the Paris Accord, and then I heard Paula make the announcement that uh, CPS is going to provide half a million dollars to UTSA to develop a climate action plan, and I was sitting there feeling so envious from the people who were actually going to work on that, and then two or three weeks later I was leading the team who was going to do that, so anyway, I don't know how that happened, but it did happen, uh, and it's very exciting. Uh, again, like Doc said, we're probably not the first city, we are not the first city, or not even the first major city to develop a climate action plan. Uh, we are probably, at least to my knowledge, the first city to do it in this way, in this collaborative way. So uh, the fact that this plan is going to be developed in collaboration between the city, the municipal government, uh, the utility, and a public university is, to my knowledge, I think, a first. Uh, and we hope that the way we do it becomes a model to other cities that they can follow. So it's a way of taking advantage of, of local expertise and working collaboratively uh, in a way that, that hopefully <coughs> develops something that is beneficial to the community. Uh, it's also allowing us as, as UTSA faculty to contribute to the community that we're living in. I, mean, uh, I don't look like a typical Texan, I guess, right? I have been living in Texas for quite a long time, so maybe it's, it's close to 20 years. I don't know. Does that count? Is that really long enough? Okay. So, uh, so it, it, it does feel good to be part of something that will actually hopefully have a positive impact on the city. So, so what, what are we doing? Uh, so again, this is going to be a collaborative effort between the three organizations and we fully expect many, many other stakeholders and organizations to, to play a significant role in that, including the Sierra Club and other organizations. As far as the UTSA team, uh, the first time I got the scope of work from Doug, and if I had any doubts about how complicated this project would be, and I did not, I looked at the scope and, and, and it was clear that this is going to be something that, that we need to pull a lot of different expertise to satisfy. And, and the good thing about being in a university is that we can do that. We have people with, with varying or old experts in their field, and what we did is we put together a, a strong team of about seven faculty members from four different colleges with varying expertise. So we have Myself, with, with the, my previous expertise is on the built environment uh, sustainability side, uh, greenhouse gas inventories and so on. We have an economist on board, we have an environmental scientist. We have several people who are specialized in public policy and public engagement. Uh, we have other, I mean, these are the key players. We have, we have other uh, smaller roles uh, that will, will participate in the project as well, as well as many, many students, which is a huge asset that I think we are also bringing to bear in this project. Not just the students who will like, be paid to work on the project and then gain experience from that, although that in itself is a very positive thing, because that's an experience that they will take with them, but it's also the larger student body that we hope, intend to try to take advantage of as much as we can and use them as the people who will carry the message then to the different parts of the city. Uh, and, and it may not be just UTSA students, we, we certainly can take advantage of students from other universities as well. And I think that's a huge asset that, that again, to my knowledge, few other cities have, have had available for them or took advantage of. So, uh, as a team, as an ETSA team, the first thing we did is we sat together and we started to kind of try to make sense of what we do. There are a lot of different talks that, that, that I'll talk about in a few minutes, but we, we wanted to make sure that we're clear about our role in the project. So, so we put together a few what we call overarching objectives that I'm going to briefly go through just to tell you how we see our role as part of that team that's going to put together the project. So, so the first thing that we all agreed on, and I think uh, both the city and CPS expect that from us, is that we want our work, work to rely on the best practices from all over the country. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at what other cities have done, we're going to see the best examples out of that, and we're going to try to at least meet, but even exceed what they did. So our goal, in, in summary, is to 
do the best job possible uh, with regard to with regard to developing the climate action plan. Uh, the second thing that, that we all agreed on, and again, I know that both the city and, and, and CPS uh, have stressed that repeatedly, is that this project is not just about the science, it's not just about the numbers. We will do the science, we will do the numbers, we will do the assessment, but it's, it's primarily about, about engagement, about going out to the community, about presenting our case, but presenting it based on, on, on tangible information uh, that, that, that makes sense to people. So, so simplified information that people can understand and trying to get input, get feedback from different, from all possible stakeholders uh, and then use that as the means to develop a plan that will have uh, the highest possible level of, of shared responsibility within the community because in, in our view that is probably the key criteria that is needed for that plan to have any chance of actually being implemented. And I don't know about you, but if, if we put together a plan that doesn't get implemented, I'm going to be really, really frustrated. <laughs> so, so we know that that, that is our goal, yes. to have something that, that has a chance of success. Uh, we also, uh, again, uh, make sure that uh, we're going to rely on, on as much expertise as we can from the community and putting together our work. Uh, and we want to do it within the time frame possible. So our, our time frame right now, if you don't know already, is about a year and a half. Our intent is to try to achieve that as much as possible. It is a lot, it is an enormous amount of work, but, but we, we feel reasonably certain that we'll be able to do it to the quality we expect in, in the time frame that, that we need. Okay, so, so our scope of work really, you can think of it in terms of three strands going more or less in parallel. So we have the two strands that are the climate action and the climate adaptation. Uh, so the climate action plan, and again, I'm sure I'm telling you things that you already know, is going to consist of us developing an inventory, a greenhouse, a comprehensive greenhouse gas inventory of the city. Uh, following 2016 data, we hope, uh, that would include uh, building energy use, utility energy use, uh, transportation, industry, wastewater, solid waste, and then uh, potentially land use, so we'll follow the, 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 the best practice protocols in, in doing that. We will try to backcast that inventory historically as much as we can. We're hoping to be able to go back to 1990, but unfortunately that may depend on availability of information, so we'll go back as far as we can. Then we'll look again at, at best practices and we'll try to identify potential strategies that can be used to reduce uh, the inventory, to reduce our footprint, and put that in, in several scenarios, present these scenarios to the city, along with, so for every strategy that we're going to look at, we intend to develop a comprehensive assessment of the economic costs, economic benefits, and other potential co-benefits that can achieve and be achieved from that strategy. That, be, that could be clean air, clean water, public health, employment opportunities, etc. Avoided costs, maybe, if that's, some, uh, if that's going to happen. So we're going to put all that together and we're going to present it to the city and to the community. We really believe strongly that as a team, as the people who are actually doing the numbers, we are not, we should not be advocating for one strategy or another. That's not our role. Our role is, is to present an objective assessment of, this is strategy number one, that's what you're going to get if you do that. This is number two, this is number three, this is number four, and so on. Then present it and get feedback. And a decision needs to be made about what is the community willing to do at what time frame. Based on that decision, we're going to come back and develop a plan based on the strategy that will help us achieve that decision in the time frame that, that was accepted. That's not a decision that we expect to make as the UTSA team. We're not going to sit in a room and decide, okay, the city is going to reduce by 10% in five years or 100% in 100 years. That's not, we can't do that, but that's not really the process that we're looking for. That's something that needs to come out of the community. Once we do that, then hopefully, that once that decision is achieved, we're going to turn that into a plan, develop an implementation plan, and that will be the climate action portion of, of our work. In parallel with that, we're going to have a climate adaptation track, if you will, and that will start with a climate projection, which we're working on right now, and based on that climate projection, we're going to develop an estimate of, of what impacts the climate may have on the city uh, over the next maybe two or three decades, and then based on that again, we're going to develop some strategies that hopefully will help the city and the community to better, to be better prepared, to, be, to better adapt for whatever, I think, expected changes. I mean, we all know that 
even if we are 100% successful in mitigation now, as of tomorrow, we still have changes that have already happened to the climate and will continue to happen for some time as the climate comes back to normal, if that, that is assuming that we do cut down our emissions immediately, which, which we cannot do. So, so we, we need to be prepared to the changes that are happening, that are forecasted to happen, and both the city and the community need to understand that and, and have plans in hand to better respond to that. So along with these two tracks, we envision a third public engagement track uh, that's going to run in parallel with these two. Uh, it will consist of a number of activities, so there are a number of uh, committees that the city is putting together right now, steering committees and, and, and some technical committees that will provide feedback for us. So we'll be presenting our work to them, getting feedback from them. Uh, there is an expert committee from all over the country that again we, we will go to and this is what we did, please give us feedback. Uh, we will have multiple forms of engagement with different stakeholders in the community in, in all possible for, forms. We will have community meetings, we will have workshops, we'll obviously we will have a web uh, uh, presence, we will have social media engagement and many, many other uh, forms of, of, of public engagement that, that we're in the process of, of putting the details to as we speak. Uh, and our idea is to have multiple rounds of feedback between the work as we develop it and these continuous engagement activities. So that again, by the end of the process, the product that comes out becomes representative of what the San Antonio community really wants, what the San Antonio community is really willing to commit itself to. Uh, hopefully that will happen in a year and a half, it's still a very long time. Uh, and we'll see, I mean, the three of us are, are kind of spearheading the, the different teams from the three organizations. We're already seeing a lot more of each other than probably the two of them would like. But uh, yes, he's not. <laughs> and we'll continue to do that over the next few months. And, and we hope to have you engage in the process as much as possible over, over the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. We should probably introduce your. Could you stand up and say you're from CPS and you're from the. I'm Rhonda Krish, I'm with CPS Energy, and I am the team lead for the Climate Action Plan for CPS Energy. So, my name is Vivi Vega, and I work for the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District, which is the city health department. Um, I'm the, I am the, I am the Office of Health Equity, um, <laughs> which is a very new position within the health department, but um, we are really trying to reduce health disparities in our community, and we saw alignment with a lot of the, what Office of Sustainability is doing as kind of shared priorities, because within the realm of public health, we are also very concerned um, with climate change, and it, it kind of covers a lot of the focus areas of our work, including you know, food security, um, open space, air quality, and um, and we're getting some public health emergency preparedness, vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases. Um, so there's a lot of health health issues and health effects of climate change to our community. Um, we also are very concerned because we know within health disparities that the most vulnerable groups in our community are most affected by climate change. And so we are building up a lot of community alliances. Um, and those vulnerable groups would be you know, low-income people of color, um, LGBTQ, elders, living in poverty, and high social isolation, and then also children are very disproportionately affected. So we have spent the last couple of years, um, before the Office of Public Equity, kind of really building up um, neighborhood relationships and both our childhood obesity prevention work and also our violence prevention work. And so we want to kind of build upon that and see if we can integrate um, with the climate, you know, climate action plan if we are able to and also help kind of lift vulnerable community boys and grassroots community boys because oftentimes that is ignored um, in a lot of city and public initiatives because of several reasons, but um, so I just really wanted to come and, and think and help us think about you know, the health effects of climate change and how those most vulnerable groups are affected in our community and it is really, really important, especially now with the city focus on equity, um, that we don't fall into fakeity 
and really focus, you know, kind of elevate those voices from the, from the very beginning of our planning. Um, I know it's often different, difficult because a lot of people who are doing the work within the organizations, you know, have maybe a cultural misunderstanding or cultural disconnection from those communities, but there are several grassroots organizations that are very willing to help make that connection and prioritize those, those groups. So I would like to just see a, a bridge in some of those communities and that work. complex part and I'm hoping Wendell can come up and help me on this uh, because the way this room is shaped it's really hard to make sure that you keep track of who would like to speak and so forth uh, next. I would like to ask everybody please uh, if, if you've got comments or questions so forth keep it very succinct and please then wait until other people who want to speak have had a chance to uh, ask questions or make comments before you have your hand up again. Uh, and so, Wendell, if you can help me keep track of, of who, sort of like in which order and so forth, um, people are getting called on, then um, that'll help help keep track of things. So I, I'm trying to keep notes and also to uh, make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, so uh, one just real quickie I would like to add for the purposes of, of letting those of you who weren't here last month, we had a very lively meeting on the whole issue about climate change and equity issues. And uh, some of you probably aren't even aware of the fact that uh, Sierra Club nationally now is committed to climate justice and environmental justice. And so we are very concerned about the whole issue about equity as part of our national policy. And, uh, it's going to be exciting as we go into this because I'm hoping that in addition to um, that official stand that we'll have a lot of opportunities for our members to be working hand in hand with those community groups that Houdi was just talking about. I think that might be one of the um, most exciting things that could come from this whole experience is to have uh, building a sense of community solidarity on this issue. Um, so uh, let's just toss this out for questions, either questions to the speakers or questions and comments, your ideas about how you'd like to see the community get involved, um, some things that you might want to suggest to these people that they make sure they put in their planning process. Okay, now whether you're going to keep an eye on everything, I'll call on Jerry Morrissey first. I kind of like to know about the inventory or what kind of inventory of public health issues here because it strikes me that it's really the much the climate adaptation is really part of here and so do you have a good feel for the number of people how to identify the people are going to be affected how are you going about going to go about doing that the number of people who are going to be affected by sorry by by climate change in other words how, how are you going to identify the affected communities in an effective way because it seems like to me the question is if you don't identify them, don't have groups that can deliver the services, then they're going to fall in the cracks. And I, I've seen that happen too much in these communities. I don't live in this community, but when other committees that I'm on or did things on, I don't think they were properly represented. Well, as part of the scope of work that we were given by the city, we were asked to have two overarching uh, frameworks that we used to essentially examine all the tasks of the project. One of those is equity. Uh, so one of the tasks that we're working on right now is to develop a framework of what equity means within the context of that plan. And then we're going to use that framework to essentially assess each step in the process. Uh, that will involve, when we identify any strategies, we'll have to look at different segments of population and see how these strategies might either positively or negatively affect these uh, groups disproportionately and take account of that. Uh, obviously, when we talk about the adaptation portion, many of the potential effects of, of, of climate change do have uh, extreme, adverse, and disproportionate impacts on, on, on disadvantaged communities, and we will take that into consideration. So, so that's certainly a very important and, and a very basic part of, of our work, and it's, it's, it's a clear uh, component in our scope that, that we're, we're, even if we weren't interested in doing that, and we are, 
it's something that the city has made clear should be uh, a name lens that, that we, we use to look at each and every task that we get. The other, the other framework that we're developing, in case you were interested, is a small cities framework. And again, the notion is to take advantage of small cities technologies to have the highest likelihood of, of success for the strategies that, that we're proposing to reduce greenhouse gases. Small cities. Small cities. Smart. Smart. If you take a look at the uh, vulnerability assessment um, that was done as part of the sustainability plan, it has a uh, it does identify a protocol for identifying vulnerable communities, uh, and basically it, it's, a, it's a standard protocol that lots of cities have used. It's looking uh, doing a lot of mapping around um, census information, uh, seniors, uh, low income populations, uh, young children. And you basically start um, uh, mapping out all these different groups and where you can start seeing some um, concentrations. And it's a good starting point to figure out, you, you would overlay urban heat island, you would overlay um, uh, different um, health outcomes. You can really start figuring out where those populations are. And not surprising, it's mostly east side, south side, you know, we, we, we know where they are, but it's really fine-tuning it. And, and as Hazem said, it's it's figuring out, okay, well, what interventions or strategies do you need to um, employ to target them? And the real interesting thing is when we start overlaying the sort of the, the long-term climate projections, because we know where, you know, we look at the data now, we're trying to extrapolate out 40 years from now, when you start looking at extreme heat or do um, uh, flood zones shift because of increased precipitation? So there's going to be a lot of analysis as to really sort of drill down where those populations are now and in the, in the future. How about socially isolated? Is that one category that you're trying to figure out how to do? Because there's there, a lot of a lot of a lot of folks don't have families, especially older people, socially isolated. You know, I think. I mean, that's, I think, and we're taking notes, I think that's one of the things that we can do and we're going to have to rely on a lot on is um, seeing what methodologies are out there. One thing that, that I'm really intrigued in, and I think we need to, to figure out if we have the capacity to do it, is, is an idea of, um, of um, social cohesion, and it might, that might be something that's sort of related to that, where um, after Superstorm Sandy, they did a, a sociologist did a study of, of neighborhoods and those that basically responded the best. Mm -hmm. And what they found was, you know, it wasn't the you know middle class or affluent neighborhoods, it was, it was lower income neighborhoods and they started digging deeper and it's because folks in these neighborhoods mm -hmm. know people, their families there, they, they have tight um, social networks and in the absence of, of um, emergency responders, they were able to mobilize. And so how do we, how do we learn from that and start identifying locally where we can start building that sort of network across the city. So the health department has actually had a neighborhood program for the last couple of years where we've been trying to focus on neighborhood organizing around health, um, primarily active living and healthy eating, but also to kind of build those social networks. And then I think it's important that like we've talked internally in the city that we have kind of like data silos. So we you know, the fire department has a pilot program where they have identified through their EMTs, their kind of high utilizers, um, meaning, you know, people who are transported to emergency rooms really often. And it's not just people with chronic diseases, but it's more people who are socially isolated, who have mental illness or comorbidity with chronic diseases. So they, they asked us to kind of help with our organizers to connect those people to a social network within their neighborhood. Um, so there's some, I think we have to kind of do a little more digging, but we do have some resources within the city. And then we have tremendous community resources and community groups that are on the ground in, that, in the neighborhoods doing that organizing already. Why don't you pull your chair out like uh, Adam has, so that that way uh, you, everybody can hear you very well, because that was really important. Um, let's see, uh, Wendell, help me keep track of Right, this guy right here. Okay, you're up. <laughs> so, um, this is not that we've done this before in this city. And, I mean, like I said on the health committee with Dr. Cigarello, um, we had accountability, government transparency, all this stuff. So my question, and plus there was money 
uh, can, and some fairly large sums of money from the federal government and other sources put into this. So what input, what history have you gone back to with SA 2020, which we started discussing with the mayor in 2008 with Mayor Castro? I mean, we, we had seven or eight meetings in which a thousand people showed up to you. And we went through all of these issues. We had just a, a huge, enormous list of things. And um, I'm kind of curious, you know, we, we put metrics on every one of those things, and we, and we measured those kinds of things. So, you know, 1% of new reduction in energy consumption from CPS, those kinds of things. Um, so where has that input been? and what has happened with all of that. Occasionally I get some kind of an announcement from SA 2020. Um, but I, again, you know, about seven, eight hundred, a thousand people showed up seven or eight times at the tri point or wherever it was. And we had all that input and we got all this databases. We have the Kaiser, you know, family, you know, the foundation, all these different kinds of foundations and databases. But we have a local, organization that's already done this here for San Antonio. And I want to know how that's been put into this. Have we just erased the Castro's because somebody else became mayor? Uh, absolutely not. I think uh, part of the thing that, that we've talked about is that whatever we do needs to be placed in context of previous efforts. So, so we are certainly looking closely at what happened in SA 2020 and what happened in SA tomorrow. Uh, and, and all the different strategies that were proposed and all the community feedback that, that, that was collected. So all of that is going to feed into the work that we do. I think that the, the step that goes beyond what, what happened before that we we're proposing to do is that, like for example, when you say that in SA 2020 there was an objective of reducing or increasing energy efficiency by a certain percentage every year. Well, to us that's not the end point. Our end point is to say, okay, how much would it cost us to do that? Is that the right objective? Can we go further? Do we need to go later? And then with a better assessment of cost and benefits, I think we can go to the community and have them provide more informed input. So I, I, was, I participated in SA 2020. I was one of the people in, in, in that event, and, and, and it was great. But again, people were, were giving feedback based on perception, based on their personal opinions, which is great. It's very useful. It's very valuable. But I think once we start better quantifying what, what is associated with each one of these strategies, again, learning from that input, putting that into consideration, we can, I think the level of feedback that we can get from the community would be, would be a bit better, and, and people will make decisions that, that, while understanding the consequences, okay, if you do this, this is what's going to happen, and if you're okay with that, great, we'll do that. I, would, I mean, I would add, SA 2020 was the plan, I mean, it was indicators, um, and so um, I think SA 2020 is still tracking those indicators, reporting on them. Some things are going the right way, some things are going the wrong way. So it's a cause to step back and say, okay, why? You know, why are the indicators not tracking where we wanted them? Um, and we haven't tracked greenhouse gas emissions. We haven't done this before. I think they'll be um, looking at. Uh, and I think so. I, so I see the climate plan and SA 2020. I mean, I think they're they can complement one another. And I think even when we talk about the SA Tomorrow Plan, we never wanted to throw out SA 2020. So we developed the sustainability plan and we started looking at the indicators that we were going to come up with the sustainability plan. We worked with SA 2020 to, to try to identify that, that common ground, ground and fill in those gaps where there, there were some. So I... So the one thing that came up over and over and over again in SA 2020 People stood up and hollered about it to each other and at the, at, at the MC was the fact that we've got 16 school districts in this city and 22 in the county. And if you want to have a situation where you do something to bring the community together on, on a huge spray of issues, if you don't have if you don't have this fundamental pillar of the community like public education, if there's no coordination there. Um, so the question really is what's been done, what's what's been done about that, where are we going with plans to do that? Because that's one of the engaging the school districts. 
to engaging the school districts, consolidating the school districts, you know, equalizing your government. All this is about equalization. If you don't have equalization in terms of the tax bases and the funding of the public schools, then you're not going to have you're not going to have that in housing. You're not going to have in anything. You're going to continue with these little barrios, and, and they're all going to be competing with each other for attention and assets. You know, nobody's coming over here and fixing the potholes in my street. But they get, but these guys over on the north side of town get that done just like that. Yeah, I, mean, I think we'll take that. I, it might be a little bit outside the scope of the, the climate. If you're going to change, okay. you're going to change okay. climate. Pat, you've taken your few turns. I know. Uh, 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 Wendell? Somebody over here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking, um, and just throwing this out here, but I mean, we, we work with the uh, UTSA uh, Department of Ar College of Architecture on, uh, you know, doing some LID stuff, and so some work's already done. And um, the Heat Island thing, it, it seems to me like, even apart from climate change, everybody would recognize the benefits of keeping, especially the downtown area, cooler. And I remember when I was younger, all the businesses downtown did this big campaign to make your roof look pretty uh, because they were building the Hemisphere Tower and they said, okay, look down and when somebody's on the Hemisphere Tower, everybody painted their roofs and it was this huge community initiative. And I'm thinking, I think everybody would get behind stuff like that for the, for the heat island, like paint your parking lot white, you know, do your white, you know, uh, uh, white roofs, you already have that initiative, but but I really would like to see something just go forward even even before yeah, this to address Heat Island. He, I mean, he, I think you, you remember Heat Island in the sustainability plan. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be working with um, Councilman Trevino to figure yeah. out how do we he, um, move it forward because I think uh, I, I think one of the things that we've heard from the mayor and from several council members is yeah. This Planning process is great, but whether we're talking about air quality or GHG reduction, they don't want to wait. And so I think we'll be bringing, there's lots of best practices, a lot of policies out there that we want to start moving forward. Right. And then I'm hoping that you'll include those, that research. I think it'll be, in, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> what is the actual geographical area uh, on which you were going to collect data? Typically, the best practice is the, the city, the boundaries of the city. However, in this project, because we have CPS, then we're talking about whether we can, if we are able to, we'll probably expand into the service area of CPS energy. But again, that's something that, that we're looking into right now, and we're, we're going to make it. So, so we're going to make that decision. We haven't really decided finally yet. Well, what I'm going to say is the city. I, know. <laughs> is, um, I think one of the things that we, we want to do is make sure that um, our, particularly around I think our plan and our methodology um, as they eventually relate to the, the greenhouse gas inventory is, is consistent with other, other cities so we can basically benchmark against them. I think the, the one thing that we I think will have to do is perhaps supplements or uh, amends that inventory it could be. It could be. Um, to take into consideration CPS's uh, desire to look at their their um, uh, their operating area, but I think they're we want the city wants to be able to point to our inventory to know what we own, um, so we can track our progress. But I think we want also, well, we'll also want to provide CPS with their their data. So I think it's and that's probably that, that's rather be to, to have to have both both values out there. And generally, what you do is that the plans reflect where you have uh, the ability to influence. Um, so I, I think the the key thing and we we started to talk about we also want I'm going to figure out how to do it is engage beyond San Antonio and regionally as well because I think it, it's and I, I've done that in some other cities where we've had focus groups with surrounding municipalities and um, identify opportunities for collaboration because it's 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 beyond San Antonio I think it's figuring out how we construct especially that. our water supply. <laughs> The business community here in San Antonio speaks with a very loud voice. And many of the decisions that happen in the city happen as a result of the business community uh, throwing their weight around. So my question to you is really twofold. Are all options on the table at this point? 
And kind of, do you have the ability to maintain objectivity in the face of very strong... Uh, do we as a UTSA team have that ability? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So you're not feeling undue... You, you won't knuckle under to the undue pressure that will be put upon you. I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'm, I'm a researcher. Okay. I'm going to present the objective facts. You, and, you, and you can take the facts and, and make a decision either way that, that, that doesn't... That's not my role. But my role is to present the objective facts. So are all options on the table at this point? We're going to look at all possible strategies, yes. Okay. CPS energy is. Things like um, I've used in the past meetings in a box, um, which are really uh, super simple. It's basically you take a, a three hour forum, you translate it into materials that anybody can run themselves that are available online. You download them, you can have them with your neighbors, with your, your church group. You run your own little mini meeting, you send it in. Um, block walking, I think one of the biggest things that I'm really looking forward to is the student involvement. Um, if we can, if, when I did this in New York, um, we actually went out in neighborhoods with sort of a mini survey, again, boiling down the objectives of these three-hour plans, and you talk to people. Uh, it's labor-intensive, so being able to work with the students to get out in the community. And I think we're just really looking for ideas. I, we're going to be working with the faith-based community. Um, the cities. Um, we're really excited about working with uh, uh, Reverend Ann Humpke, um, who's the city's faith faith, faith based liaison. Um, I've always for years had trouble engaging with the faith community. It's just not it's not easy. And she came on board I don't know, it's been a year now or so, but she had a resilience event and I went and she had 150 people. You know, it's she it's, it's all about who you know and, and those those trusted um, uh, advisors. So I would put it out there to all of you. If you have recommendations, if you have ideas, I mean I think everything's on, on the table because we want to go beyond who we just ordinarily get and we need everybody else's help. Can I ask one follow-up question on that really quick? But are you going to be incorporating some of that you talked about with like the messaging towards certain stakeholders? I think that's key. It's mm -hmm. not just going in and saying, I mean, yeah. you know, like you said, sometimes you can just say like, climate change, rough people the wrong way, and like using terminology that will... And there's, and there's if, if you're interested, um, there's a lot of really good research that's been done. Um, and it's, it, it breaks down successful messaging um, to different groups is sort of a guide, but I think one of the things that we really need to do here is what's going to work for San Antonio, what's going to work for our different um, uh, communities. Um, and I think, it's, um, I think that's where it's, that, I think that's going to be the most challenging part, um, because um, we need to, to build this support, the support that I believe is out there, um, but just, just get it coalesced. Particularly with our political system, there's so much turnover, you know, and so I, I, you know, we don't want to create a plan um, that potentially four years from now, um, you know, we have a shift and there's nobody there supporting it. So I think, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Um, I have a comment. I understand that Pope Francis has sent a letter to the bishops. Uh, indicating quite clearly his support for addressing climate change. So I would suggest you go to the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of San Antonio. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I just had a question related to um, uh, the area of coverage, the geographic, etc. 
We have a number of island communities uh, like uh, Leon Park, uh, Leon Valley, Almost uh, uh, Heights, uh, Alamo Heights, etc. And uh, Almost Park. So, have we begun to form any kind of a uh, discussion or uh, alliance or reach out with those communities? Obviously, they, they're really part of all of what we have to deal with. Uh, they may be primarily residential, but not necessarily. Um, and so I would say it'd be important probably early on to get them involved in yes, something. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what was the name of that? Excuse me? What was the name of the alliance? I, I, I'm asking, I'm suggesting that you know all of these independent little communities that are within the greater San Antonio area, um, but not part of the city of San Antonio probably should be involved in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to just affirm the importance that I'm getting that you're putting in getting community input in these initial stages because I think what happens a lot is by the time a lot of people hear about um, certain efforts, they're already, you know, way down the process. Something is being presented, and really feedback is being mm -hmm. asked. And then there's no presentation after that to make sure that the feedback was actually, you know, interpreted the way community meant. So um, I just really want to um, affirm and stress how important it is that people understand that they're being invited to shape something from, from you know, close to zero. And that I know that this is really hard to do, but developing some type of relationship, you know, working to develop a relationship after that is, is, is really, um, I think, valuable. Um, with the, uh, a lot of people sign in, you know, at different city meetings and never hear from the city ever again. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what those sign-in sheets are for. Um, only lately have I started to receive some emails, but it's it's been you know it's been many years that I didn't receive emails after signing in at, at every meeting. So um, just some type of you know ongoing effort, um, even if you don't see repeat people, they're they're still reading their email, they're checking that page, whatever, right? Um, I also wanted to ask if there is going to be some, um, oh, I'm sorry, also another thing just to really um, affirm the uh, stress that you're putting on regional outreach, because I think also these issues really um, are a good way or a good you know, place to build urban-rural relationships, um, which you know, we don't often have and are really hard to do. Um, and I think that's really important. I think it'll help us in a lot of other, you know, connect in a lot of other issues. And um, I did want to ask if there are any benchmarks for reporting on what you're finding, um, not just to community, but to other city um, task forces, groups. The one that I'm thinking about right now is the, the housing task force. I really think that, you know, this, this task force is just starting, even though there's years and years of, you know, some efforts leading up to it, but there's this kind of renewed um, interest and, and renewed kind of um, openness, right? At some of what you were, I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Is it Doug, Doug. Doug, I'm so sorry, Doug. Um, some of what you were talking about with kind of this new general administration locally, I think that, um, you know, they're looking at housing in a different way, but I'm really still not hearing a lot of, you know, sustainability or mm -hmm. climate justice coming into that conversation, and I think it's really important that it, that it does. Yeah, and those are, I think part of the process is going mm -hmm. to promote the, I think a lot of this is education. You know, I think, I think um, you know, one of, the, one of the big things that's going on internally within the city organization is resilience. You know, everybody, ever since, ever since um, uh, Harvey, and we have councilmen um, flyers all over uh, the idea of resilience, and nobody really knows what you know. And so, trying to figure it out. So, what I think what my office is trying to do, because we've been looking at resilience from the crime perspective for years now, is trying to translate it into meaningful ways across the city organization. So, for instance, um, the city has 
uh, been working with the city architect and some other departments have been working on new design you know, guidelines for city facilities. And so you know, I stuck a little thing in there around resilience. Mm -hmm. Simply, you know, have you checked the flood flood maps? <laughs> you know, um, is this going to be used as a cooling center? Just very simple things to get people thinking about translating climate into some <coughs> real terms. I think the same thing can be done for housing policy. And for, it, but again, it's translating it from the climate idea to something that they'll actually understand. So I, I definitely appreciate that. And to your first point about having multiple points of engagement, this is exactly what we're intending to do. So our, our intent is not to have just finish the work and go and present it. No, we'll have interim points in which we will have parts of the work that we can present, talk about, get feedback, incorporate that feedback, and come back again with the next layer and the third layer and the fourth layer and so on until we have that final product in the end. And one of the things we're, we're finalizing is on my to-do list, the engagement plan. Once the, the project website's up and running, basically we'll get, we're going to post, here's the engagement, engagement plan, here's the engagement um, process. You get to see here's the feedback loop. So here's you know, phase one, we're going to be doing X and then get feedback and then we'll spit it back out and say, okay, this is what we heard, you know, here's the next step. And so it's going to have multiple check-in process. Um, I'd just like to add that as far as accountability and follow-up, um, that's something that we've been trying to kind of do in a lot of our, internally with the health department in terms of speaking about health equity is the idea that, you know, building trust in certain communities is the key to everything and the basis of everything. And, the, and part of that is the follow through and follow up. And so, and building those long term relationships. And so, um, I know that Eloisa from sustainability and I have talked a lot too about like holding kind of community forums in certain neighborhoods where, you know, they are extremely vulnerable because that's something that we've been doing a lot to try to just have kind of listening, very open listening sessions about how they have been affected by a certain issue or a certain health indicator or health issue. And so that's something that I think can also, we're building those relationships. Um, we're building relationships too with a lot of specific stakeholder groups and individuals within certain communities, so within the African American community, um, within certain areas uh, that are vulnerable, and then also with LGBT groups and with um, immigrant and undocumented immigrant groups, um, which it, I found is very interesting because a lot of them, especially the ones coming from Central America, have lived through a lot of natural disasters, so they're, very, they're a group that is very easy to talk about that because they have that lived experience. Can I just add something to Pradeep's comments? Because just before the meeting earlier today, she was talking about how uh, how people's sense of empowerment is a big part of the building the resilience. And so I think that uh, the more we can have those kinds of opportunities for um, even some of the poorest or most uh, uh, difficult to reach communities are certainly capable of becoming empowered and becoming able to express their own voice and and uh, end up with that kind of community building that would make a big difference in this city. So uh, thank you for your comments. I just simply wanted to note that the Greater Bear County Council of Cities is one of the target groups Terry is describing. The Greater Bear County Council of Cities comprises members, mayors from uh, the Leon Valleys and the Castle Hills and the Alamo Heights. They meet at the Alamo Area Council of the Governments Monthly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jerry, did you have a question? Yeah, I was, are y'all anticipating the climate denier people actually mounting a social campaign against this? I mean, that's what I'm concerned about. You've got this media, social media out here and, and they're, they're organized and they're liable to try to undermine this process by turning out and, and actually, uh, you know, saying no way. Um, they had a bomb threat for this meeting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they're out there. I mean, I'm, 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 sure, I'm, I'm sure they're, they, they will. Um, I've worked on plans where they've come out. There's, they have methods to disrupt. To disrupt um, um, meetings and there's methods to disrupt the disruption. So I mean I think it's it's to be expected. I think um, 
you know, one of the things that's on my list to do is when we start getting into the, the you know, ramping up to engagement, um, go through training with the engagement team so they know how to, to basically handle it. Because I would honestly be shocked if it didn't happen. Well, it's probably a better turnout issue too. I suspect that some people don't. We don't know in those neighborhoods where they're going to target, and maybe you, if you had people turning out who spoke far, I, I guess I'm talking about an organizational effort because I I see District Nine, I see you. You know, I'm kind of wondering where those good people are going to go. Well, I think you know one thing that. One way to counter that is, is, is to not simply rely on public meetings. Uh, and that's where if we can mobilize um, throughout the neighborhoods, throughout other networks, um, and get that input. Um, you know, you have a group of people who come to one public meeting, yet you go through and, and, and there's hundreds of other people who have been engaged and you can, it counterbalances it. So I think it's, we can't simply depend upon what we're going to have four meetings uh, for public meetings and all of a day, it's got to be much more. So you're you're going to try to weigh that sort of stuff. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I, it's it's to be expected, and you know what? They have a right to express their uh, opinion. They don't have a right to disrupt the meeting, which is what they try to do. They basically just come in and try to shut it down, so you can't even have the meeting. What I've seen in the past is um, a lot of times um, the group uh, that that's being facilitated will sort of self. Um, um, Dispel that person. You know, the, the 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 people in the meeting will basically sometimes just tamp it down. Or in the past, we've just had a staff person take those people. You move them off to the side, and you have another little facilitated conversation. But the key is to keep the the conversation going. Uh, yeah. Oh. No, no. Go ahead. I I just wonder, um, trying to put all this together, how the City um, City Council <clears throat> saying that they wanted to support the Paris Climate Accord. How that fits in with this? And did the City Council say anything besides that they wanted to support it? About the ways they wanted to support it? And also where the City Councilmen fit in in all this because I just went to a meeting that my City Councilman, who's District 10, Clayton Perry, and I think he's the only City Councilman who didn't vote to support the Paris Climate Accord. And I, I kind of wanted to bring that up in the meeting, but I didn't. But I wonder how, if I, it would help to bring that up. Or he seems, um, to, he seems yeah. to want feedback from his what, constituents. So what you know, would I, I say to him? I think, yeah, work, you know, work with your, your, your friends, your neighbors. Um, you know, throughout the city, there's people who, who believe in this. Um, I think generally what you hear uh, you, you, you only hear people who oppose or oppose most, and so definitely, I think there's an opportunity for you to work in that district. Um, <laughs> Lots of luck. Okay, um, may, I mean, may, I've been fooled before by politicians, but he was acting like I'm very. I want to hear what you all have to say. I'm going to listen to what you say. Um, he the needs account? to hear it. Yeah. I mean, they're they're all obligated whether they agree with you or not. I mean, they're supposed to listen to your opinion and. Uh, you have the right to provide it. So, you know, if they only hear from one side, then they'll, they'll say, oh, that's, that's all I'm uh, hearing is we don't believe in that stuff. Mm -hmm. So at least they need to, you know, he may still vote against Paris, but uh, um, he'll at least know there are constituents in his district that believe in climate change. And so the, resol the resolution that council um, passed basically supported the, uh, the goals uh, of the, the, the Paris Climate Accord, both in um, uh, reducing emissions and also in, in adapting to climate change. And so I think one of the scenarios uh, that, that would be part of this planning process is a Paris compliant um, pathway and what that looks like. And then what will be eventually at the end of the day, um, after community engagement and talking to stakeholders, we'll be delivering to mayor and council, here's a plan, here's the roadmap, uh, and it's, it's up to them to to approve it or not, um, and uh, because it's a um, it's a city document. No, and he's just one guy. So. He's, and, he's and well, there's two. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I have two questions. I'll ask one thing first, and then go back and ask later. There are other people. Um, since we are kind of at the 
we're, we're beginning a process that some cities have already begun, not the climate change action plan, but um, the effects of um, decisions made. Um, so when you say best practices in terms of housing, will you be able to look at different um, mm -hmm. affordable situations? Um, how, what are the best practices for handling affordable housing going into the future? We'll deal with the best practices in relation to every aspect of the plan. So yeah, yeah absolutely affordable housing would be one of the Because I've it. been reading, you know, there's a question about tall buildings versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, or park-like settings and just two or three level buildings with you know low income, medium income, and uh, high income all in the same unit because it's better for the community. Urban infill is one of the strategies that many cities are exploring, and certainly I'm, I'm expecting, I'm fully expecting that we're going to be looking at that as well. Okay. So, so I think the short answer is yes, we'll, we'll be looking at all of these strategies. Mm -hmm. Because if we, yeah, when you, so when you start looking at all the, and again, when you you, you start you start looking at examples of, of, of what? climate action plans across the country. They're all relatively Sim similar in terms of methodologies um, and, um, and strategies. Uh, I think some are more progressive than, than others. I think the charge to UTSA is, you know, we want everything's on the table, um, everything's up for discussion. When you start looking at reducing emissions in San Antonio, it's land use, it's transportation, it's 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 all all part of it. June? Yes, um, speaking as a former uh, president of the Neighborhood Association in District Eight of all places. It's um, the best district. The what I ran into was uh, <clears throat> when. If, if we are wanting to talk about things like the uh, uh, the road solvents that they were using and so on, many people on the board said, well, we don't want to deal with that. That's not a neighborhood issue. And I could never convince them that it was a neighborhood issue. So I hope you got some way when you're dealing with uh, groups of people in neighborhoods to convince them that what you're talking about is a neighborhood issue that they should be dealing with. Because they think they should be dealing with things within their boundaries. Yeah, I mean, I think the sort of gets back to what we were talking in the beginning. It's, it's framing the, the conversation. I mean, I think we can't force anyone. Um, to agree or, or believe or, or engage, but um, you know, in terms of neighbor neighborhood associations are, are key, but neighbor neighborhood associations are just one. Well, no, but, but I would like. You know, I'm serious. I I would oh, like I believe to you. really think about what what how are you going to approach groups where they feel that they should be dealing with things within their boundaries, but not outside of their boundaries and they consider some things to be outside of their boundaries. Can I, can I um, speak to that? I've spent several years working a lot in neighborhoods and working specifically with neighborhood associations and in our kind of place-based neighborhood organizing we've tried to talk to neighborhood associations about kind of broadening their base and broadening their focus within the neighborhoods. And so we actually have had some neighborhood associations that express to us like, oh, we're overrepresented by homeowners, and we are overrepresented by elders, and we are overrepresented by people who are disproportionately only concerned with property and, and, and crime. And so we've been able to try to bring more families into that conversation or connect the neighborhood association with the local elementary school or with local churches. That has not been the uh, ideal situation in every neighborhood, but it has happened. And I think um, another thing that the city is kind of talking about is we, the city through different departments has had some kind of neighborhood grassroots leadership initiatives. And those have focused very much on neighborhood associations. But now that we have a new 
Department of um, Neighborhood and Housing Services. Um, that person who is running that new department is actually very interested in creating this broader neighborhood leadership academy um, that will help connect all of those dots within the neighborhood to broaden that base of involvement and also the focus. And also we've, we've seen some neighborhood associations that are in similar regions, like form alliances, like they attend each other's meetings. And so some of that is happening, um, but there's, there are plans to expand that. And then the only other thing I would say is I would argue that it is a neighborhood issue. That, that, well, know, yes, that's what I argue. And, and I think, and I think, we'll, I think you know, the data will be, able, will be able to provide data, you know, as a part of doing the, the, the downscale climate projections to be able to say, all right, here's your neighborhood. What are you going to do when it's three weeks of 100 plus degree? You know, I, I think it's framing it in terms, right. hopefully, that they can understand. That they see that it affects the Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I think that's a good, a really important point and ties into something that was said much earlier about uh, Harvey and the neighborhoods that responded best and things. Uh, because, um, again, it goes back to that either formal or informal association of people who live together in a community. And there was there, this woman professor at uh, a and wrote an editorial in the paper a month or so ago, and I forget her name, but she pointed specifically to research about uh, responses to disasters and uh, th that sort of situation at places that were engaged, and she was promoting, and she has apparently promoted um, pre-disaster planning mm -hmm. um, for neighborhoods so that people can respond better. You know, they're prepared ahead of time. And so if there's any way to kind of link climate change and neighborhood associations and make people understand that they are related and they should think about it and be engaged, maybe that's one way to do it, is to tie it into resiliency and response to disasters of different types. He didn't. Absolutely, I could definitely see that. that I was just going to, you know, and to address Jim's point, like back in the 80s, 90s, maybe even before that, but there used to be a thing called San Antonio Co Coalition of Neighborhood Associations, mm -hmm. and it had like 350 neighborhood associations, and at the SACNA meetings, the, the different representatives, they were open to everybody, but different representatives would come and say, you know, that's where we pitched our stuff about supporting the water quality regs and all, but they were talking about community-wide stuff, and then those representatives would go back, but it was implicit that, you know, if the SACNA yeah. uh, reps had voted on it, it was moving forward, so it didn't right. take up time. Whatever happened to that, because that's, that, that's what I was used to from back east. We, had, we had a council and neighbor association, and it just from the, from the city process and from the staff mm -hmm. process of trying to engage, it, it was a lot easier. They would do a lot of the work themselves and then be able to present yeah, unfortunately, it was, it, there was a, a, you know, because it was really successful and in, in, in implementing a lot of changes in the city, uh, it was co-opted pretty much by the very San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, uh, and, and then it just, it well, just died. I had a kind of a slightly different interpretation. I was very involved in that, and frankly, I think volunteers just got burned out, and uh, the, it was most successful. Uh, uh, through Howard Peaks period and before mm -hmm. Howard, and uh, he told me, he said, "What, you know, why aren't you neighborhoods being active toward the end of his mm -hmm. term?" And, and it was because the volunteers got burned out. So anything that the city can do to help volunteers mm -hmm. maintain uh, these efforts, uh, it's really greatly needed. Special. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when will transportation be phased in as a subject to talk about? And then also, since we're in a transition in terms of transportation, we're moving from combustible combustion engines to EV battery operated. Um, 
we need all the options. Are you going to study all the options? Yeah, I, I think along in terms with of, via yeah. you know, to find out. And then the question would be, how many? How do you want to, to handle um, electric vehicles? Um, like if a, a lot more people do move here, then how can you have so many cars on the road? And then ha can you? Calculate how the best way to handle that would be. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the as it's happening. <laughs> well, I think the, the process is going to be, you know, once once the, the targets are sort of identified, it's going sector by sector, looking at all the different strategies, um, quantifying those strategy impact, their strategies impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, and, and it was something that we were talking about the other day is in terms of. How they impact each other. Well, how they impact each other, but also making assumptions. And, and we had we had um, some consultants come in. They, they did it pro bono. Uh, um, Price Waterhouse Cooper. They they they've been doing. They did LA's plan. They're doing San Jose's. Really at the forefront of, of climate planning. <coughs> and it was fascinating to see what they're what they're doing. But the thing that was also really interesting is just the number, the amount of assumptions that go into it. And so I think part of Hazem's team team's job is to figure out what those assumptions are, yeah. document them, provide that methodology because it is projecting out into the future and trying to use best available information to figure out where it's going to go. I think you could even um, deal with it on numbers. You know, how many trains along this track or these corridors oh, yeah, I mean, the, would handle so many people. Go back to you. The first part of your question, when will we start dealing with transportation? Transportation is one of the sectors that we're going to address in, in actually developing the greenhouse gas industry. It's, it's probably going to be a big component of that. So that once we have that, then we'll start, like Doug said, start looking at typical strategies that other cities have used to reduce their GHG impact in relation to transportation. EVs are one of them, multimodal transportation are another, and so on. And then, yes, we'll have to make some educated guesses about how these strategies will be adopted or not, what types of programs will, will facilitate that adoption, maybe uh, make it happen faster rather than later, uh, how they affect each other. All of these are things that we're going to be looking at. Absolutely. And the cost benefit. And the cost benefit of each. Because yes. it might be that you could keep adding more trains to attract. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know. But if that's the case, then you're not going to have as many EVs and vice versa. Right? So yeah, we'll, 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 right. take, we'll need to take all of that into consideration. Absolutely. I'd like to ask the audience also a question, and that has to do with some of the things that we could be doing right now to be uh, tackling issues of climate change. Um, and uh, wouldn't it be nice if by the time they get to 18 months from now, we've already started accomplishing some of the things uh, that we might be able to do? Um, suggestions from y'all? Start attending the NPO meetings. Good one. You know, and go on there and making suggestions. Okay. I mean, they have money. They have federal grant money. And they decide how it's going to be spent. Other suggestions? That's good. That's a good one. Other suggestions? Review the sustainability plan that the city has already looked at. That is, there are a lot of strategies within the sustainability plan which have not been resourced and accomplished. They've been discussed, they've been vetted, so in my mind, in a certain sense, when they're energy reduction uh, processes and uh, renewable processes, I think that they could well be worth a second look. Just look at your own house or your own business and start using less energy and less water and less resources in general. Because it's going to be different for everybody. And then also, um, <coughs> quality of life. <coughs> Put birth control in the water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it looks like it's time to quit anyhow. Thank you all very much for coming. Yes. Yay. And I want to mention uh, that uh, we're looking for volunteers to coordinate these programs uh, in the future. Uh, you know, we put on a program every month. Our uh, Barbara has been doing this for a number of years, and she's looking for uh, somebody to pick up the uh, slack a little bit. So I uh, would love to have somebody give me a call and uh, say they're, they're interested in doing that. 
she obviously gets to meet a lot of interesting people and study a lot of interesting topics and uh, we really need some help. Can I ask a question as well? Because if Meredith said that equity is a good question, then how would you describe it? Um, is that something that you've talked about? Like how do you because one of the things that I that we've discussed internally and we worry about is that when we talk about equity, like we usually are like for myself, I'm from the east side and we're preaching to the choir. We're talking to people who are already one of the who have their lived experience. We really need advocates for equity who are outside of these areas of concern. And so how can you all mean an outside group really advocate for equity for vulnerable groups within the city. Especially to your, since you're in a position externally from the city to be advocates and to talk to your elected officials and to hold them accountable that it's not just the language of equity that they're using but you know, it's actually happening and it's actually being integrated in their decision making and in their policy making and in their um, you will, um, I, I guess as chair I'd like to address that. Um, the Sierra Club itself, of course, has a history of its own regarding that. And it's not always uh, exemplary. And so the Sierra Club itself has been undergoing some internal um, analysis and uh, discussion. And so, personally, I know that um, I'm on the state executive committee, and I know that nationally all of paid staff are going through training on this subject, the equity, diversity, inclusion topics related to trying to, to reach out to other communities than the, uh, you know, the, the, Let's face it, the standard uh, impression of what you think of Sierra Club is somebody who looks like me. <laughs> um, and that's not necessarily what we want Eric of the world needs. So, um, the, uh, so, so there's really an effort to uh, expand uh, with understanding uh, into other groups. Here in Texas, the state chapter has had uh, training and discussion uh, in this topic. And uh, we recently had uh, some strategy local discussions and training on this topic. And uh, so uh, we hope to be doing more so that our members um, will be more sensitive to all of these things and uh, communicate better and um, certainly um, advocate uh, as well with uh, government and other organizations. Um, and I know that some of the Sears Club historically uh, and currently are uh, uncomfortable with this, are resistant to it, are dropping out of the club even in opposition to this because they don't feel like these are core environmental issues. And I guess to that I would just say that uh, uh, for all of us who are members and hopefully read the monthly uh, Share Club uh, magazine um, just a couple of months ago, there were uh, you know, there was an article uh, about Honduras, and of course that woman who was executed, uh, assassinated for advocating against the dam uh, construction in Honduras. Um, the, the, uh, there was another article about people in uh, India, another article about Native Alaskans um, dealing with climate change issues. Um, so. You know, to say that uh, these different issues are not related, I think, at this point, is really just pretty much untenable. And uh, furthermore, um, I just saw recently in The Guardian that uh, so far this year, 273 people around the world have been assassinated for 
advocating for environmental justice, environmental change. So to think that um, we can just be concerned about national parks or the Golden Chief Warbler, I, I, you know, I wish we could, but I just don't think we can. And I think if we're going to have a decent, livable future, including you know dealing with climate change and the you know air we can breathe. Uh, we're going to have to stop putting, you know, coal plants in, uh, and chemical plants in poor black neighborhoods in, uh, uh, you know, in Louisiana and different things. It's just, uh, it's just not a tenable future. So, that's my take. Yes? Can I just make one announcement that I forgot to make earlier? Uh, TCEQ is taking comments right now on the Edwards rules. And I'm sending out an email that, that uh, I guess, Terry and Meredith will get it tomorrow and distribute it to all of y'all. But we're specifically asking them, uh, because our bill failed on prohibiting uh, uh, sewage effluent to be discharged into waterways that recharge the aquifer, we're, we're just all putting that, because they never listen to the rest of our comments anyway. He has been submitting the same comments since 2004. And, and they haven't detected us. But I think we're trying to get the governor said that he's like 99.9% you know, in favor of that. If we could get the governor to direct TCQ to wait to go do this through the rulemaking process rather than waiting till the next legislative mm -hmm. session, it would be huge. We could really start moving forward. So I would ask everybody here will send out a template just to send it in as part of those comments so that we can send uh, to the governor, and you know. Yeah, and so you can go to the GIA website probably too, but I, I just want to say that's one of the reasons we ask for your email. I know some people are, don't like, but you know, if you give us email and uh, if you're, uh, you know, we, tr we can connect you with some of these things. So the Sierra Club uh, does. Try to use your email carefully and uh, not abusively, but you know I I try to develop a calendar for weeks or events that are of interest that I send to those that I know uh, might be interested, and uh, um, so this is something that like if Annalisa sends me this, I will send it to that group of you know 50 or 80 addresses that I have of, of people that I know uh, might be interested. Yeah, we'll put it on the front of our website under the latest news, but the deadline is October 27th. And this is again important because, uh, you know, do we really want sewage on our aquifer? Uh, and do we really want petroleum spills on our aquifer? And, um, you know, all the development that's, you know, once the aquifer is contaminated, uh, it's a billion dollar cleaning plant, basically, that we don't have to spend right now. So, um, we do what we can to address these issues. So, any other comments? Or thank you.